So we had just opened up in 2018. We, we just got rolling. I would hired a, a pit master. He had been working for me about four or five months. He's, he was great. He, he, he ran the pit. It was a direct pit at the time. We, we eventually moved to offset after his departure. Uh, and everything was going great. He was, you know, he worked hard. He was a good guy. It wasn't until, uh, it was, I can't remember the exact date, but I got a phone call from our front desk because we also have the hotel next door and saying that uh, our night out at the time had heard, it was about midnight, had heard a lot of banging, like, you know, sh guns fired. Like, she thought there, there was a pistol going off at the brick vault. And I was like, okay, so I got up, came came over here, and and I looked in, in our in our pit room, and there was a fire, and, and it was way too early for a fire because normally we we start start our fires around two thirty or three, but this was running right at midnight. So then I started hearing, it, what it sounded like was, you know, rounds just going off in in our in our actual burn box, and all of a sudden that, that scared the shit out of me. So I called. I call the police police department. They show up, and it's funny. the The deputy just runs in there. I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! You might not want to go in there, man. Like, there's rounds going off inside that burn box." So he puts on his vest. He, we, put out the fire, but it smelled like there was. Obviously, the rounds were going off, but there was a lot of glass in the bottom as well because you could hear the there's glass breaking. There was. There was rounds going off in, inside this burn box. So, number one, that's a red flag. Nobody else has access back there. Nobody else would even know that it was a cook day. I mean, obviously it was Thursday, but who would, who would even know to go back there to do it? So, that was red flag number one. And so, once we got the fire out, you can smell what reeked of marijuana. I mean, you could tell that. Then you start looking around. Once we put out the fire, there was bongs. There was all, like probably five to six huge glass bongs that had busted. There was rounds uh, that had been obviously discharged and they were in the burn box as he, as whoever this gentleman did, uh, he had thrown all, uh, essentially he just unloaded whatever kind of evidence I would assume so into this burn box to get rid of it. Um, at that time, uh, the guy that was working for me, he was a, he was a pitmaster. He drove by, and and I, obviously he was he, the police officer stopped him and asked him, you know, was this your doing? But he was intoxicated. He was, uh, so the police officer gave him a DWI for driving while intoxicated. But he we knew that he would be the only one that had access to the pit room, and so we look at cameras, footage, we clean out the burn box, we. Don't even use that smoker for the next two weeks because it just smells like uh, it just reeked of marijuana, which for being in West Texas, you know, you, the small town of Marathon, everybody's going to know your business the next day. And so we, had, we, we pulled the trailer pit. We used that pit for the next couple weeks. We cleaned out that pit as much as we could. And so they took all that evidence that was in the burn box because there was a drive-by in Alpine a couple weeks. Uh, one week prior, and they they had no evidence or anything, but the casings matched the holes in the drive-by of the house. So that was a, another red flag. So obviously, I fired the guy on the spot. You know, he threw away his evidence in our in our equipment in our restaurant. Essentially, when we had just opened up, we're just trying to get things rolling. And so it turns out that this incident was tied to a murder case as well. It wasn't in the drive-by where that happened. It was the same night as the drive-by. The pitmaster and his girlfriend and another accomplice were out drinking in Alpine, which is 30 miles from Marathon. And earlier in the day, in the night, I guess they were drinking and having a good time and they drove by the girlfriend's ex-husband's house and did the drive-by. But then there was altercations later on after they had gone out and gone to the bar and he had, they had seen the ex-husband in the bar and they had a couple words and then they essentially followed the ex-husband to his house where there was altercation, there was scuffling where, and then 
the woman who was driving the car ran over the ex-husband forward and then backward, and then forward again, and then fleed the scene. So all while this was happening, they after they fleed the scene, they come back to Marathon. It was hush hush, n nobody knew anything. But then once the deputies and the investigation starts happening, that was a week later, and that's when the new boyfriend throws away all the evidence from the drive-by, anything that they could have think had linked to the not only the drive-by but the murder of the ex-husband that one week later so so then we think they're going to go to trial it's it takes about it, it what we everybody's saying it's going to take a year COVID happens it gets pushed back it gets pushed back pushed back so 2023 they finally have trial she is now in prison and was sentenced for 37 years for the murder of her ex-husband. So the boyfriend, he got charged with DWI, also got, of the same night where he was uh, throwing away all the evidence, tampering with evidence, and he also has other charges along with that same, uh, the murder, but he took a plea deal. So, so he didn't go to jail. The other gentleman that was in the car, he took the plea as well. Uh, she tried to claim that uh, essentially insanity that she was in the right spot, but that didn't work. You know, she got 37.